keep trying to remember, you know, we had a little disc of acoustic foam we could put it under a microphone and oh, the, you know, eliminate some of do the Do we have noise. to do the picture of us, the view of us? Yes. You don't want to be on screen? I'm not a huge fan of being on screen. <laughs> you want to tra trade places? I mean, I don't is, mind. Is that sort uh, of It's just that oh. I may be leaving early. Or we could turn it off. It's only what's no, easier. I think, I think it's more engaging when it's on. I missed the last one you guys did, so to catch myself up. We didn't get very far. I think we created a character, and that was it. Oh, then we died. <coughs> you ended up yep. with the shepherd. That is correct. Yep. What is your shirt on, Chris? Your T-shirt? Uh, it's a record label. up a second ago, wasn't it? Oh, here we go. Oh, I was taking notes on my jeans. Classic quests are uh, weekly foray into the mind of Richard Garriott um, and other works of classic role-playing games. We've been leading up to Ultima 4, and uh, so here we are. Uh, we s second session, we're, I think we barely made it past the opening screen <laughs> last <laughs> session, so we're, going, we're committed this time. Uh, last, two weeks ago, our last session, we, we ended up dying almost immediately after fortuitously our starting point was the lost city of Magincia, and uh, unfortunately, we died <laughs> almost instantly. <laughs> so uh, we're starting up again. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, and I'm Thomas Malaby. I'm a professor of anthropology here at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, and Scott Brunner. I'm also in the English department, um, PhD student. And we're here at the Digital Cultures Collaboratory, uh, couched in the uh, Center for 21st Century Studies, celebrating its 50th year anniversary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also Will Smith's 50th birthday today. I don't know if those are linked. Yeah, right. You and I are the same age. I'm 50 <laughs> as well. I'm as old as this century. <laughs> uh, there's too many uh, Venn diagrams going on. <laughs> anyway, so... We are journeying onward. Last, oh, we, hopefully that's just temporary. As I mentioned last time, uh, we passed away almost immediately and were instantly uh, resurrected back in the capital city of Britannia. And we made it just outside the gate, thought it would be a nice place to start up. And uh, so here we are. I don't know. Uh, would you like to control it or? Uh, I I, <laughs> I I'll watch for a bit. So one of the things that we noticed, some of the topics of conversation last week were, um, and we spent a lot of time on the opening screen, just the choices we tried. I think uh, one. Uh, the week prior to that, we started out as a paladin, and right. we we're trying to figure out the the system between the choices and that opening gypsy scene, and some of the tr you know we looked at some of the tropes that we see a lot of, and and these types of games, and um, yeah, I mean I, th I know we talked about it last week, but it, it, I don't know if I put it together. I thought about it later, actually, after we left the session, which is 
the you know the the uh, ethical questions that it's asking you to determine your character aren't about delivering a fully comprehensive idea of your character like well he really likes humility and he really loathes uh, you know justice it's literally only trying to find out what you value above all others so it's literally it's not a ranking list of like one through eight it's literally a list of one and everything else which mm -hmm. I think is kind of interesting it means that you're completely defined by one characteristic you're about to stumble into some combat I think before you may want to run back to town. We can Apshai. Started. What, a, a truck isn't going to be enough? Burn him. Fighting sheep. Use little faith. There you go. That's what we're going to need. Um, but I am in. Oh. Oh my goodness. They get you inside the woods because it's slow progress. Yeah, one of those uh, remnants from tradition is those um, terrain and how that imposes certain limitations on. Where do we see what our hit points are? Up in the top. The, that low number. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, just a point. If you let them run away, uh, your, see your valor, I think it's valor, just went down by running away from combat while letting hi, the uh, that other bandit run away without killing him despite the fact that he didn't give you uh, compassion. Okay. Am I going to be able to get that valor back? or? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah. And I don't think you want to walk into the purple stuff. No. There's, there's a little kind of performance theory thing happening there, like, which is constitutive of what? <laughs> you know? Is the, is the action, you know, revelatory of some inner commitment of your continuous self to be merciful? And then this is just kind of recognizing that? Or is in doing it, in choosing to do that, are you actively becoming merciful? Mm. Right? Um... Is it a being old being or becoming kind of tension is is right there in the in the architecture of it. Well, I mean, it, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, people become, um, you know, as as I'm raising children now. You know, had to discipline. Had to. Wow, this is gonna be longer. Let's see if I can quickly do this. Had to discipline my child the other day. He's he's rather young, right? He's only a year and a half old, and. You know, he was smacking the dog around. And we were like, we are not going to let you get out of your time out until you say you're sorry to the dog. And then meanwhile, that we had this like extended three hour time out because he wouldn't do it. Um, we were, found this article in Atlantic saying, don't make your kids apologize. But it was too late. We'd already, we were going to stick with it. <laughs> you got to stick with it at that point. But it's funny because so that's this is that's the model, right? Like the idea is like, you can't do this if you if you don't do what we're saying, you're not going to, you know, you, you can't do anything but be in a timeout. Well, I guess, I'm, I'm straying from performance theory, but this game is doing the exact same thing. It's trying to teach you, you have to do these, you have to be valorous in order for you to be able to get the runes that you need uh, to advance the game. I guess my point is it's, and I think a lot of people struggled with this game when it came out, not quite understanding that as a game mechanic, because no other game was doing it. The idea that your actions would be actually be logged, and I should be keeping notes here about who you're talking to, because I, I guess perf I, performance modification is what it's doing, and it's like yeah. really s microcosm. And, and it's very, it's I mean, it's very autocratic, really, in its way, right? I mean, this isn't Knights of the Old Republic, where. You know, you've got choices, and there's, you know, you're heading in one direction or the other in terms of your moral compass. There is a, there's a very clear metrics, and it's an explicit part of the narrative that these virtues are the subject of your attention. You know, it's not in the background. So yeah, these are so Monday's influence has not left the world. Ah. 
Going too fast. Sorry. No worries. So there's an artifact at the Buccaneer's Den left over from Mondane. And Mon- Ask at the pub in Mondane about a skull. Pub. Yeah. Pub about the skull. There you go. And Mondane was the uh, villain of the Ultimate Two. Oh, so what's the city? Where's the pub? Buccaneer's Den. Oh, that's the city name. Okay. It sounds like something I should destroy. But, so, I'm trying to remember from two sessions ago when I was here. Is the game, it's, but it's not like making adjustments to how powerful you are at all, right? You could walk into a crazy difficult area early on or no? Yeah. Well, that's where we, we started off in Magencia, which is the ruined town of, it was once a... Uh, the capital of pride, capital city of pride, and mm. pride caused its devastation, so it's inhabited by nothing but ghosts and serpents. And, mm. it, and that's, I mean, I, we, again, we died almost instantly because it's one of the things you're supposed to do is interact with this viper that poisons you, and mm. without any anywhere to heal, you end up dying almost instantly. I, then that, I think that comes with. Uh, starting out as a shepherd. So one of the things we were wrestling with last last time was whether that choice was going to impair us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we ended up, ended up killing the viper. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> this is going to be a, be a problem. And we read you know, we were re- reading later on that you know he's a pretty important uh, character in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think you do end up having to kill it regardless. Yeah, it attacks you either way, yeah. either way. Yeah. Um, but you're supposed to be able to talk to it one round before then it strikes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we took it out, and then we cheated. Oh, okay. Looked on the internet. And who's who's that? The, the... That's Shapiro again. Okay, and what did Shapiro have to tell us? Is a druid? That was the uh, mundane. Oh no no no, yeah. uh, compassion. I. Julio. Oh, okay, so Shapiro was looking for Julio. I think Shapiro might be somebody that can join us, by the way. I thought so too, but not yet, at least. And what is his health? And Oh, have we typed in Julio? Mm-hmm. Is he down by the schoolyard? Julio Marks. Okay. East across two bridges. So, um, there's a level system in here. I don't remember. We need to once we finish here with uh, Britain, we should probably check over to the castle, and that's because uh, Lord British, I think, gives us an update on how we're doing. I Can believe you there get is you healing somewhere. That I need. Where we just were, it said healing, but it was two hundred gold, oh. which would have cleaned us out. Maybe it's Shalimar that can join you. You're gonna say? Are you gonna say that about everyone? What? That they can join us? <laughs> <laughs> I just said that. Is this the city of compassion? Yeah, I think we can. Yes. Compassion strengthens the soul. Has knowledge. Oh, I mean, uh, tempers the mind. It's okay. I can get it. Hmm. What if you said soul? Have any kids. Oh, have any kids. I'm curious what he says if you say yes. I think he said, then you know what I mean. Hmm. There was a kid to the directly to the west. In the, yeah, I'm wondering. Alright, be compassionate now. <laughs> I am a child. I think he can join 
us getting a glimpse of our my parenting skills. So get away, brother. <laughs> For help. And for giggles and poops, when it happens to be right joint. So what about, to what extent are, do we think of games, mostly implicitly, as lying on a spectrum where at one end, the, what the game's trying to do is, is present a kind of, present verisimilitude, a rich world, where everything is supposed to behave with a kind of complexity and richness and there are individuals there, versus at the other end of the spectrum, games that sometimes unabashedly but not always we implicitly understand to be pushing be about the game designer mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. presenting the game designers picture of the human or point of view and and be more unitary in more inflected shall we say in their construction of the world because this one is very heavily that right i mean yeah. very heavily that what was i, I was thinking no was it last two weeks ago where i started trying this theory out, this idea that, uh, I don't know, I'm too philosophical, but the idea that if the world is a construction just of everybody working together to like collapse probability into like an actual reality, but games and any small piece of fiction is in, in its own way it's kind of fascinating because it's only one perspective on the world. So that's why all these worlds of fiction are so incomplete and often awkward and jagged, which of course this is, I mean, right. they, they be, and then they become, almost, they become uncanny. Because right. they're not a perfectly comprehensive world with its own structures, um, which makes them both interesting and flawed. Uh, I don't know. So you gave 10. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the uh, preferred amount is, but... The last time I played this, and I don't know if it did anything, but I was so worried about sacrifice, I would always give away all of my gold to beggars. I'm not sure that did anything. Mm -hmm. I, Again, the way, I don't know how we want to approach this, but I always concentrated on just getting through one, um, you know, one virtue at a time. Because once you get the rune, and then you say the mantra at the shrine, then you can move on to the next one. Okay. And I don't even think you have to be compassionate anymore, which, again, is kind <laughs> of a strange little blip in that. You could be like, cool, I've got what I needed. You, you know, know you that just means you up. Is that the distinction that Bourdieu makes between uh, competence and credentials, right? An institution can give you, authorize a credential, right? And the reason we use those is because they're shorthand, right? Mm -hmm. We can sort of like, oh, he has that credential. He probably knows how to fish. He's got a fishing license, mm -hmm. you know, uh, versus the actual embodied competence and capacity to do something, right? That's right? So you get the credential. It says, oh, you've got the rune. <laughs> You know, it's so great. I don't need to be compassionate <laughs> anymore. I, I've got my I got my degree. I'm walking out of here. I no longer have, yeah. Is that British town? Yeah. So the name of town that we are currently in is Britain. Oh, oh, oh. I think. Uh, so it's Britannia. What the heck is Britannia, man? Do you get your hit points back if you take a room? I'm hoping. <laughs> there you are, slumped. You didn't even sleep on the bed. <laughs> you slept in the middle of the floor. I do, so I'm and gonna. My health does go back up. I have a strange. Uh, oh, good. Memory here. Can you search the walls in this room? I think you're thinking of another place. Okay. Um, Where is it? Searches S. I remember when you. There's a secret door. There's a little dot on the wall. That's right. Which, by the way, I did not know when I played this in 1985, and I didn't know when I recently played this about two years ago, and I just literally searched every wall. Hmm. Get out of my room. Mentor. Ah, uh, there you go. So, um. The aforementioned Magincia. Pride was too great in Magincia. Speaking of shorthand, how's it coming with the notes there? Just gonna, I'll let you know when we slow down. <laughs> <clears throat> the answer's got to be a magentia, right? Yeah. Art thou proud? Oh, so oh, that, oh, he's not asking a yeah. question. I thought, I thought for a second he was saying what city was destroyed. Yeah. Art thou proud? That's, pride yeah, that's is when, bad. What's that? And pride is bad. Yeah. Pride is bad. But I feel like if I say... No, I'll be accused of being a liar. Because if I don't... Let's try it. There you go. Was it 
health. What were some of the other ones? It was health, job. It's health, job, name, join. Yeah, that's it. Look, okay. right? Can you look at them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who are we supposed to ask? It? Sorry. Who are we supposed to ask about where the shrine is? Julio. Yeah. Find the I think here is where we find someone that will join us. I thought. It's always in the pub. Yep. You did, yeah. You'd write run instead of run all the way. Try again. Yeah, try run again. There you go. of the magic orbs. I don't remember orbs in this game. No. The counting second. Devil is so he is where are we now? We're in search of food. Devil is searches for the mystery of the magic orbs. A one handed beggar knows their secrets. What was he? Did it say? Did he give him any description? Seasoned fighter. Seasoned fighter. One handed beggar. Their secrets. I guess he's a salty sword. I'm sorry? Sorry. What's that? So I guess he's a salty sword. <laughs> trying well, that, was going dad, that was a dad joke. Getting going on the dad yeah, jokes, man. You know. <laughs> Hash that scene you're, you're groaning in the back. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. Find him in Serpent Castle, for he knows of orbs. Hmm. It's an incredible list of things one has to keep track of. Can you give that to the drunken sailor who asked you to be a Joe? Some progress is the main. Oh, there you go. Yes. Bard in green. Nope. Cricket. Cricket. Shh, I'm playing. Yeah, no, I think it's good. It's too bad there's no music in this. Well, probably that might be a good thing. You said you said job and trying playing. Health. Join. Ah. <laughs> All right then. I think it was easier when I searched every wall in this game because now I'm looking more intently for little <laughs> sprites out of alignment. Right. So the seasoned fighter wouldn't join you. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're in weaponry and armor. We run into a spicy woman called Pepper. Fighting bard. Rune. Yeah, look at that. The 
saloon. End of this. End of a hall somewhere in this town. Hmm. Nobody wants to join me. You know, the other thing we should be asking them is mantra. I just remembered. Healthy. <laughs> so the end of the hallway. Oh, man. You and I played this game very differently. How so? Oh, uh, I don't do anything in this game. It's Ah. What did we do? Well, well done, man. Nice. So we have one Ultima four. <laughs> so that so that's what all you need. I mean, that's the MacGuffin for that seventh or eighth of the game. Is that the idea? We need a mantra too. So we need to know what we need to say. Now does the rune get us? I can't even. I can't remember. Does the rune get us into the shrine? We need to know the location of the shrine, which, which is, is east two bridges. Okay. So the only thing we're missing is the, the mantra. What is a non-evil creature? Something you shouldn't kill. This is very draconian, <laughs> sacred, and profane kind of thing here. Did anybody ever play the game Auto Duel, which was another game made by Richard Lord British? Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, not a lot of people did play it. The only reason I bring it up is those rocks at the bottom are also reused in Auto Duel. And every time I see them, that's what I think of. There's one bridge. It was a little. little oh, maybe an outside of town, perhaps. Oh. Charming. Iolo. Yep, this is the one that joins you. Eventually. Same, Same name. Lulu. Join you. Ah, nice. So you had asked, you had asked a question about whether things scale. In this game, it does have level scaling, which I didn't know until I re again I read Jimmy Mars thing. The amount of enemies that we will meet out in the real world will get uh, more voluminous. Like I said, if we run into like an ogre, there'll be two ogres instead of the one that we now oh, have. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Mar pointed out that that's why a lot of people say not to have people join you, but to wait because it's actually easier to play because you don't suddenly have right. combat mm. with five. Because you'll have three on your side, five on their side. He becomes sure. bogged down. I think it's interesting that he won't join because you're not experienced enough. Yeah. And there's the jester. Bueno. Shit, I should have. Excuse my language. Um, the rune was in Britannia Manor. Yeah, at the end of the hall. Which one of you is the completest? Well, <laughs> um, I think I still have a chip on my shoulder for not finishing this game when I was in 1985. So I was like this confidence that I am not going to. See? You got somebody to say something. But if we have to demonstrate compassion, and they said that we we're supposed to be compassionate to the kids, I'm wondering if there's something to raise our compassion yeah. we're supposed to be doing something with the children. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Punt. If they're, if they're little, if they're really little, they're puntable. It's great. Now here's the question that I, you know, you, what, you could do, what you can't do in Skyrim, you know, you can't attack the children in Skyrim. But I'm pretty sure you could probably hit A and then down um, if you were an evil sort and actually attack the children in this game. Hmm. But I also know, and I know this is made of knowledge, that your compassion goes up by letting monsters run away from you without killing them if they're fleeing. So that's another way for us to raise our compassion. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, hey, hum. Oh, I wonder if that's 
the no, because the mantra is like one word, or isn't it? Um, it's I think it's a... no. That's I think the mantra. I'm not sure, but it's usually something weird and kind of nonsensical like okay. that. You got it written down. Hey ho. Told us where the shrine is. Yeah. Pepper knows where the room. Pepper knows we the already room. have the room. Damn it! Did you get um, weapons or arms? Says I had a staff. I think you're because so our sprite does. We selling some of these things now. Am I a paladin here? What do you mean? What is my? I thought you were a shepherd. Oh, it's okay. Your weapon is your staff. So the other stuff you could sell unless you. Oh, sell. you do have a staff. If I could get a sling too, right? Yeah. Hmm. I think you can use a sword. I don't think there's any. Uh, Class, um, but you know, I don't know that. I know this has got some distance. Oh, you had to tell him one. Oh. So, you think I should get a sword? I would go with the sling. I'm sorry, I think your initial intentions were better than. What about armor? Oh, that's the other side. They're both in Winston. Leather? Yeah. Oh. That'll clean us out. Alright. Make sure you equip both. Now you can sell the cloth armor you have. What if I have to uh, let's see. Ready a weapon is R. And wear armor is W. Not too shabby. It's better rates than they give you in uh, Skyrim. That's for sure. Let's see how. Oh, okay. So why don't you we, we want to go to the um, shrine? Shrine, or do you want to go into? We we still. I mean, we definitely want to go into that castle at some point. Start talking to Britain. Okay. Um. You, can we try going to the shrine Go first? Yeah, 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 I'm not. But here's the problem. Here's the problem I ran into, like I said, playing this game a couple of years ago, is it's hard to, it's like we have this cloth map, which has like a very vague idea of where all of these cities are. Of course, it's on the screen as well. But there's like, until you get enough to have a spell, there's no way for us, to, like, I don't know how you keep notes of where you found the city. There's the second bridge there. I, I think... I'll get poisoned. Yeah. So I 
I think I'm going to go back oh. to the castle and get an uh, antidote if I can. Nice job. Hey, all right. 54, not bad. A few more of those will be wearing chain mail. You're running, yeah, you're running this into your goggle cams. I go, it's too bad there's not because I just feel like downtime or not on camera it almost makes this into a little grinding. So he left that behind? The gold? Yeah, because nice. you didn't kill him, right? Well, but wouldn't you think that if they're looking, if they're talking about wanting to reward mercy, you'd probably want to design the ability to gather resources even if you're being merciful. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. We want to talk to that Jessica. Oh, I thought you could talk to that. Yeah, Chuckles, which is the name of somebody that worked at Origin, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, Britannia Castle, I need to run what he's in here. Chester, Chuckles. Fortunately, I lost one, but you still have yours. Now, am I supposed to say yes here? I mean, is it is this asking? Oh, is, like your character? Well, I think because there's yeah, a no. part there's a part in the beginning, right, where it does say. Yes. I was going to well, bring up a point, you know, we, we were talking a little bit about, you know, one of the reasons that I think it ultimately became so big was the emergence, this idea that it was a simulated world where wizardry and bard's tale kind of, um, kind of come down to not much more than really, you know, combat that's based on like databases, right? There's, there's pictures, there's not much where Richard Garrett is trying to simulate a world. And I think a lot of, I mean, when I was a kid playing this game, I remember the other kids that were playing the game at the same time as well. So many of them didn't play this game to get to the end. They were just so thrilled that you could do everything yeah, in this right. game, that you could attack <laughs> children, or that you could right. come, you could spend all your time trying to find how to how to get the you know the secrets in the castle. And I think you know you can attack guards, you can do all these things. There's all these, and of course the guards will retaliate and chase you outside the city and all these things. And that was enough gameplay for a lot of you know my mm. peers at the time. Um, but I remember walking. It, it's it's. Well, oh, you saw I that. see it. I saw oh, it. So kind of, you know, there it is. It's a little bit lighter pixel there. Run directly. Wow, in. that is subtle. There's one here. And then there's one. Uh huh. Is that an otherwise inaccessible part of the castle back there? Okay, so what is that? Yeah, what's what to the left of here? It is both strong and beautiful. Sean. <laughs> Watch the water. What about watch? I come from a prize. This must come from a Jensi. My town was destroyed. The ruins lie on an L. Long. On an isle at latitude KJ long. L. A longitude L L, latitude K J, longitude L L. I'm gonna write this down. All right, I'm, I'll do. Okay, so the ruins. Isle. Latitude, K apostrophe J. Well, quote mark. Have we seen sort of navigational grid indicators in any view? It comes Not with a spell. Yet. Yeah. What's that? Once you get a spell, oh, okay. that's what I'm saying. Like it's so difficult because it's actually possible once you get that spell to start saying where am I, and it'll tell you. You try to watch it. Just curious. No. Right. Does she move away so you get in there? Yes. Trying to go into the water. 
<laughs> you meet water. Oh, you can talk to it. You I am water. <laughs> I have an actual. No wonder it holds bears some watching. I hold a secret. Ooh. Okay, do, do just for giggles. We try Join. To go say secret. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> say secret. And now write life. Forty-two. I've just been rereading that lately. That was nice. See if you follow the, the outside of the wall, I think you run into some. It's funny the, the the memories that this conjures up. I can't remember most things that happened last week, but you can remember this stuff. Ooh. Hmm. Peril? Perils. Oh, headless perilous place. Once thou entered, I have. So it's like a teleportation indication there. I may not return. Whence we came. I didn't. A lot when I played this two years ago, I didn't run into this guy. And thou art doomed. Try doom. Grim. <laughs> now, what is he saying? Does he mean out here? Um. Oh, that's maybe locked. here. Wait, why couldn't you open the door? It's locked. The, you can tell by the way the red, red things. Red, yeah. I think that is one of the dungeons. Um, I think you're right. That might be what he's referring to. I just want to make it clear that I can never find the dungeons until I'm playing with other people every single time. We've already found one in like two minutes. This is... Ooh, oh, is there something for stairs? Or Oops. Or ascend? Or Climb. Yeah, K. There you go. More locked doors. Jimmy? Keys. Marxian perspective to this game. Uh, the mm. fact that the workers have absolutely no identity. I don't know what they're saying. Maybe more Marxist reading this game would be problematic. Why does he need a name? He serves Lord British. <clears throat> now, what distinguishes the people in this world are the single word adjectives. Sometimes more than that. Grim, tired, beautiful, charming. Name? 
Thanks. Her name, I suppose. That was sexist of me. <laughs> you couldn't tell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perception because it tells us. So but she can't help you with me. <laughs> Just thinking. That. <laughs> this is death. It is definitely death joke. Fight for my country. Oh, man. Fight. I was going to say something. Fight E for Britannia. Oh, here we go. Seek out the smith named Zircon in Minoc. For he made the mystic arms. Only they will save thee in the abyss. Let me write this down, Chris. Seek out Smith named Zircon. Zircon. I get the feeling that there aren't too many subversives in Britannia. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great... Yeah, somebody should read it against Plato's Republic. <laughs> <laughs> With, I mean, British as the philosopher king. This came out in the 80s where there's only bad and good people. There was a binary world in the 80s. Manic. Yeah. Well, it's in, I mean, I keep thinking about that that question about the spectrum you were saying before. Yeah. About whether it's, you know, this is clearly a manifestation of Garriott's ideal world. And, and a lot of games were and continue to be. Um, what was it on the other side of the spectrum? Though? It was more descriptive, right? Prescriptive at one end, descriptive at the other. You know, where you're trying to give not a normatively charged picture of what the world should be or ought to be, mm -hmm. but a kind of rich account of a world in red and tooth and claw, right? Warts and all, which Skyrim, I think, is trying to do. Well, it, yeah, that seems to be the... <clears throat> direction that games are going in. I mean, it's funny because I think games now are, are going out of their way to not have binary decisions here, you know, not, you know, good and bad. There's always these levels of gray. It's funny because I tend to actually push back against it. Sometimes I just feel like it's lazy. Like that, you know, then we can add the idea that these are complex moral choices just at both, both, you know, side. I, I'm thinking in terms of Skyrim. I was thinking about the last actually eight minutes. Have you guys have played, played Skyrim, mm -hmm. but you know, you have two factions that you can join if you're going to the main quest. Mm -hmm. Either the kind of, uh, you know, the, the indigenous folks who are also kind of, they're kind of racist, right? Yeah, totally. And then you have the colonialist, imperial things, you know. Um, not a decision you know makes what? you feel. But if I can break in, I was about to go there. Like, I what I think is really interesting about Skyrim is that. On the one hand, it sounds like they worked really hard to come up with two sides that either one could be a reasonable position. But as you play the game, I, I and at least in my experience of playing it, it's pretty clear that siding with the Nords in Skyrim is kind of the evil choice, right? <laughs> which, which seems to me to be about Bethesda, knowingly or not, kind of making the ca a case for imperialism, right? <laughs> Or, if not so cynically, or not so uh, darkly, maybe at least in these times, making a case for kind of governing institutions as against uh, parochial interests, or, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, that game just overall has a weird relationship. I, it, does, it, it has a real problem with um, isms. <laughs> it, it just, I can't remember what town it is. But it's actually, you know, it's kind of the architecture of it is based around the caste system, and the lower you go into the depths of oh, the yeah, city, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the dark elves are in a certain area. Yeah, that's it. And um, it, I spent a lot of time in that city for a paper a long time ago, and it was more frustrating because it was so clumsy. It's like there's yeah. these there's these gestures to make right, right but at the same time. You know, you have the problems with the Nords and the overall, uh, like it could be encapsulated in one town rather than, uh, yeah, we have no problems with the, was it the, what's the king's name? 
the Jarl, Jarl, Jarl. Jarl. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I sided with the Nords. I always tend to as well yeah. because, I mean, Imperial still. I mean, I'm Star Wars generation, yeah, right. so They're, anything Imperial. That's where I think they're they're on the one hand kind of trying to be a little challenging, you know, like. You, if you do the Empire, you learn that they've got, you know, some bad people, but the main general who's kind of overseeing uh -huh. the whole efforts in Skyrim is a very sort of reasonable yeah. and, huh. you know, honorable kind of guy as hmm. far as that goes. Um, but I haven't really done more than dabble on the Nord side, so I don't mm -hmm. know how where it gets to. But certainly the, the guy who, on the Nord side, if you back him, becomes the the new he's for in windhelm mm -hmm. right is you know the kind of the ends justify the means kind right. of guy yeah it's funny i mean i remember siding with the north I, i've i i think we've even chatted on this channel a little bit about some of my problems with skyrim um and gameplay mechanic things but it's funny because i mean i did play that game at the end but i remember very little of it um unlike morrowind which of course is a game that i will proselytize to the end of my days because that's one of my favorite games mm -hmm. ever um I, I, I feel like I I should have I should have hung in there right. through the murk. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they haven't they remastered that. Or no, is it like a, but a I don't have a problem. I mean, I'll play the original, and I've never finished the I've never finished the main quest in Morrowind, despite right. the fact that I have sunk hours and hours only because wow. I don't want to attend. Mm -hmm. Right, and well, then Skyrim was later. There was a point where I'm like, I'm good. Plus, I'm it takes ten minutes to walk a, a foot. That's you know? my problem. I mean, <laughs> it took forever. In I can solve that problem for you. The first thing you have to do uh, is there's a boot, boots of speed. That game's, uh, you know, the, the default yeah. movement is way too slow. Oh, so terrible. the first thing you do is you, there's a town, like four towns over in Korshoff, for a while. Yeah. Um, but then once you get there, um, you can buy these boots, and all of a sudden your problems are solved. This is the first thing I do every time. Oh, I wonderful. Play. Yeah. Is yeah. it Q that but, sends you off in one direction? A, I thought there was a key that would, and you would just hit that and off you go. Boots of speed. The funny thing about the boots of speed is that it also comes with a drawback, which is it, it lowers um, your vision because it has like a curse to it. The way to do it is to select one of the stars in the sky that means you can see at night just as well as you can in day, and then it's not a problem. Sorry, that's more than probably for the chat. That's but great. Wow. Yeah, good to know. The movement speed is an absolute pita in that game. So, so I have a question. You know, in, in my limited amount of time observing you playing this game, it's, it's, there's a certain wide readiness to keep gathering the notes and gathering the information. Are you going to save time later having done this? <clears throat> because my, my my the way I would tend to proceed is like, all right, let's go find that shrine or let's go find Zircon, you know. <laughs> Maybe this is a pulled over. I, I played a lot of adventure games, right? I wrote for an adventure game website. That my I have this is just a practice I always do, which take all these notes amount to, to to refer back to. That's how I've played games for a long time. Yeah, I guess I actually am not a note taker for the most part. I mean, I did when I had to, but the seer. I think part of it too, when we started the talking about this, it was also a that was. A, an activity that you did when we were originally mm -hmm. playing this game because you had so little to go off of. You had mm -hmm. your your information, but if you didn't keep a map, you would end up playing it like I did uh, when I was younger. You just wander around yep. forever yep. Um, until you've basically had enough of the terrain memorized yeah. or some. I mean, yeah. I don't remember half of this stuff. I never finished the game as a result. Mm-hmm. No, it, well, as we said, here we go. I could bring in uh, oh, in Stewart's class last week. We were talking about we were looking at the game La Noir. Um, have you guys played that game at all? Um, What's your game? La Noir, rock star mm -hmm. game. You know the facial. Yeah. Well, weirdness. we were talking about the fact that it has ludic dissonance, which is such a great drive, which I hadn't heard of before. Uh, you know how your character actually behaves is completely dissonant to what the narrative wants you to do. Right? You're supposed mm. to be straight laced cop but then it has this whole mechanism throughout the game where you can where you drive just just like Grand Theft Auto where there's a huge open world which you can drive and it's kind of tough to drive and follow the rules so you'd also get bored because you're like are you really going to wait at every single light so it's easier to run over the pedestrians and go so you have this huge ludic dissonance between what your character is supposed to be by the fact that you've just run over 10 pedestrians then you get out with mm -hmm. your partner and are talking about the case you're on where you know you're probably a worse you know murderer than the person you're tracking is 
That wasn't my point. My point was that the game doesn't know what it wants to be because it has two elements. It has this open world Grand Theft Auto game, but inside of it is a very, very classic old school adventure game hiding because you have to look at every clue. Then you have to do this mechanic that you're talking about, which is look at suspects and decide based on their face whether they're guilty or not. So I made the joke, you know, I said in class, and this was a very awkward comment, felt like Grusin's idea of remediation, which is the idea that we are remediating an adventure game inside an open world game. Mm. I'm only thinking of that because this is doing the same thing. Here we have an adventure game where we have to keep copious notes like I am here to remember where the MacGuffins are, to open up the door, to get somewhere, to advance the narrative, and that's classic adventure gaming designs. But at the same time, we also have a character who has hit points and levels, right? So we have mm. two clashes of two different mechanics. Right, right. Anyway, sorry. That was... No, that makes sense to me. Crystal Lee mentioned that there's a popping sound. Don't well, the table is pretty noisy, unfortunately, as part of that. I tried tightening up when I got it. But... If your name is Hawkwind, are you going to be anything else other than a seer of souls? You're not really going to be Hawkwind, the guy at the weapons store. Lemmy. Wasn't Hawkwind one of the... Um, one of the heroes in Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champions, there was several of them. There was Corum, there was Elric, there was, I think one of them was Hawkwind. That's a, this is very obscure mm -hmm. fantasy yep. literature reference. But he had a whole, you know, you learned the most about Elric, but he was supposed to be one of several. Corum was missing an eye. Yeah. And that series was recommended to me back, I can't remember, was it... Uh, I can't remember what graphic novel hmm. had him. Is it Elric? Was yeah. It like blonde, white an hair? albino with yeah. the Stormbringer. And I, I've never found a copy of any of Oh my of God. The, of I have of some books. of them. I, I've gone to bookstores and I always look Michael Moorcock. And I have really? Never, really? I've never found a single copy. I will keep an eye on because when I go to the airport, I feel like I've seen them in the Renaissance books there. Uh, huh. I, I will bring. I I've only read the first book, and it's literally like a hundred pages, right? And it's a read like yeah, that. Is it? it takes yeah. no time at all. But oh, that's all cool. I've read. There's so I don't like eight or nine of them or didn't. something. And uh, yeah, it's it's this kind of it's psychedelic in in its own hmm. way, and it's very tragic. You know, he's he's a sorcerer, but he's too weak basically to to do much except that this evil sword which can suck souls gives him the power to actually be an agent in the world so that's the the tension is okay you know he has to take tons and tons of drugs i believe to even be effective is right that right, that right right and he's um he's like the heir to this throne um i'm trying to remember what the name of this graphic now it was a fantasy but it was like this aardvark oh cerebus yes yeah so elric is a uh, or someone modeled off of elric is kind of appears in there. Yeah. Hmm. All right, guys, I'm going to step out. All right. But good luck. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. So I'm now writing this down. Give this I, I know by the back of my hand. You can ask him how we are doing on any one of the virtues, and he will give us basically a status report. Okay. So we have not shown compassion well. Be more kind. Which means that we can't go to the shrine and do the mantra and get our... No, until we're more compassionate. Okay. So you could try, try valor. So all right, not yet a valiant warrior. Oh, you did that. Just, yeah. What? That's oh, there you go. There you go. So now we could go to the shrine, but and and he'll. Oh, uh, sorry. This I don't remember. I guess he tells us how many times we have to type in the mantra. But we don't have the stone, nor do we know even where it is. What are the, some of the other ones? Honor. <clears throat> yeah, um, compassion, humility. Valor. I did that one, but it's... Join. <laughs> <laughs> you should lie. Okay, well, that's good to know. I forgot about that. I think it's interesting, you know, I said that <clears throat> there's a fair amount of grinding in this game just from the role-playing elements, but you know what, there's a bit of grinding with the virtues, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you that's have kind to... of, and I don't quite know what to think about that, because... It's weird, if you think about it. Like, I'm, excuse me for a second, I've got to go be compassionate for if you're running around... Well, the whole, um, this was mentioned before, and I was 
uh, playing at the time, but the to reduce virtue to a quantitatively empirically derived form. But is it is I mean it's interesting. I mean, that's what video games do, though, right? Isn't a reduction. I mean, there's we also have quantifiable reductive hit points, which are basically just a measure of our health or, you know, strength. I mean, it's it's all. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, it's even I think more bizarre. It's even an abstract concept like a virtue. Yeah. But technically, to boil it down to, and this comes back to the fact that it's simulating this kind of world, and to do that, everything gets. But you know, especially abstracted the line of work that we're in. I think our tendency would be to critique this, mm -hmm. but I think there's also something to be said for, like appreciating someone who, if this is the language that you, like this is how you see the world. Is this? I mean, and this is why I I think games like literature and and. and Many art forms. This is the best argument I can make for mm -hmm. being including games as uh, viable art. Right. Is that it gives those who speak a certain language the tools to express it, where painting and literature may not have been. And so I think this is why we see a lot of these things boiled down to this. But it's interesting video. Just the fact you brought up like the games as art debate. It's really interesting because the, the class that I'm teaching online, I just made them go through the chaotic exercise of trying to, uh, the, in their discussion post, they had to say whether games are art or not, despite the fact that I think that debate eventually becomes kind of meaningless because it all depends. It's just a semantic argument at the end. But it keeps but coming up. It does, well, it does, well, I mean, I think it mattered, I mean, it mattered to me, you know, it mattered to me a lot because I played so much games as a kid, so when mm -hmm. I first heard people, you know, having this debate, I'm like, of course it's a legitimate art, I couldn't have possibly wasted all that time as a kid, yeah. but I, but it, it's, but I think the point that you're making is one that I, I don't, do you know Anna Anthrop, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, we, we've done Twine, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the points that she makes in her Zinesters book is exactly that, is whether it's necessarily an art form to other people, it is that the design of games can be revelatory for the designer, right? Mm -hmm. It's such a, I think, you know, I don't know if you've ever, I mean, I think we played Queers of the, in Love at the mm -hmm. End of the World, but have you ever played Dysphoria, a game that she made? It mm -hmm. looks like a, take you five minutes to play, it's worth doing if, if you have time, but, um, it's it's like this looks like an Atari twenty six hundred game like Atari twenty six hundred kind of meets NES and it's all about Anna Anthrosy's transition to a woman okay. and she uses nothing but a lexicon of of games which I think is the one thing I assign to my students but I find so fascinating like she's trying to say that she doesn't feel that she fits in as she's transitioning to a woman so she shows like a Tetris block that doesn't fit with the other blocks right oh um, yeah I think I have so seen there's this. a great and I, just, I couldn't believe this when I played it again the other day there's a part where she talks about how she's feeling really powerful so um, she uses like an icon of Superman and you have to fly through hoops mm. and that's an obscure reference to the Nintendo yeah. 64 Superman game that's considered the worst game of all time uh, because you have or, to fly through nothing but hoops. Oh, I, I know there was. A, I didn't know there was one for the Nintendo. It is often yes. It gets written up a lot of times as the worst video game of all time. I remember the one for Atari. Um, but my point was just that she was saying that you know I, I don't know if this was rel you know this provided revelations for Richard Garriott, but it certainly did allow him to express his worldview. Yeah, but and he was making these for money too, which it's not a hero. Yeah, that's that's what makes it difficult to swallow because I I like to look at I think I mean uh, to push this whether it's art or conversation to the point of like nausea I think where games get to the point where they are definitely making those gestures is when they start I think like um, Twine games do it a lot, but uh, Stanley Parable. Mm -hmm. When you start, when you start to make self-reflective commentary, especially at, in spite of the audience, I think that's where you you're in a good place mm -hmm. to claim that type of status, if that's your. Which well, I mean, again, I mean, this seems to be coincidence. We just mentioned Stanley Parable. So <clears throat> in this section that I had my students do, where they had to read all these, had I made them read the Ebert. Games are not art. Then I had the mean Brian Moriarty hero of mines 
you know, apology for Ebert, where he agrees with Ebert. And then I had them read uh, Brenda Romero's a TED Talk about games are Kelly Santiago of that company, F- Flow and Flower fame. But the game I made them play this week was Beginner's Guide. Nice. And I was like, okay, after you think about the game, and then uh, Phelan Parker's amazing uh, article in Cinema Studies about the games as art debate, which is just brilliant. Um, hmm. Made them read that as well. I don't, and anyway... But I said, after reading this, after thinking about games as art, I want you to play Beginner's Art, Beginner's Guide, and now tell me, this is art, this isn't art, or if this isn't even a game, right? And I yeah. think that in some ways that's the better argument to make, because there's no, I mean, Ebert says games can't be art because they're interactive and they can have different endings. Well, Beginner's Guide can't. Um, but why is it when we start talking about art, we always end up on Davy Reading? <laughs> I have yet to take a game in, in I have te- yet to take a class in game studies where I don't play a game by Davy Reed, and that's true every single time, mm-hmm. uh, both San Diego State and here. Interesting. All right. I'm not taking notes on Lord Bridge because this stuff I know pretty well. did was talk to him see the power of conversation join <laughs> okay what else how about uh, compassion so is he will, he will he tell us actually will he list the virtues for us oh man so let's let me let's make let me get that done Honesty, join, compassion, jo- joiner. <laughs> Honesty, compassion, valor, justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality, which is such an unbelievably abstract concept, and humility. So we've got to go to a shrine for every one of these damn things. Do you think it would be possible to do one each session in two hours? Uh, I think there's so much overlap sometimes between, like, you know, you'll you'll hear a secret in one community for another one. I think it's a good goal. Where are we at, by the way? Uh, it's about 2.10, okay. 2.11. Seek ye to know how the eight virtues form into the three principles. Oops. Know ye, no, she's asking, know ye this. Say no. Seek it. Eight virtues, three principles. join us now that we're level two. Oh. Are we getting questions from the from our viewers? Um yeah Chris Lee was on. Is he prison? Yeah. Whoa. I don't know what those are called. Can you what's up? So oh, this is the prison. Can you talk to the prisoners in the on the the west? Those are both locked, huh?
God, he's gonna join. We need a chef. Damn. What's the popping sound? That's when I adjusted, uh, but it was the uh, sound of the game. That's funny. Yeah. The, the sound quality is pretty awful. Just, but, you know, do what you can. If people say the Commodore, I think it was the Commodore 64 version was the one that had music. And people say that it's worth it. I, this is what the graphics looked like on my Apple II, mm -hmm. and this is what I remember. There you go. And then the other reason is to like the I love the idea of um, you know like doing one room each week. But the problem is, of course, you kind of have to grind the damn virtues, right? Like we have to yeah. spend all our time being compassionate, and I guess that means letting a lot of monsters run away from us. Yeah, that and giving to every beggar that we see. But I don't know if it was. A, to a sum amount that you give or if it's the number of times that you give. And I keep wanting to buy... We need to buy uh, reagents as well. Um, Has anyone been in here? I don't think anyone was in Britannia that could... Mm -mm. I also like about the, I forgot about the, the lunar cycles. That's so, so cool. The moon gates and whatnot. But see, this is what, this is what will drive me crazy about this game. is because, like I said, there's no way to know how you found a place until you have a spell where you can locate and start writing down where places actually are. how I prove compassion in my real life too. By how often you let oh, wait, I'll run into highwaymen, you know, on the way here. <laughs> I'll usually <laughs> beat him down. I'm like, now you guys you guys can go. Remember there's a little moon gate somewhere in this woods. Now see how do we know if they're like we're not supposed to fight evil creatures? I think they're they attack you no matter what. Yeah. I don't remember anything ever being in this game that was not. Right. That's what, yeah. That's how I remember. It's like everything that attacks you.
wonder how, just on a programming level, it keeps track of these actions. I mean, I guess you know you made a point about the gold. Like it must keep true. Like it's like the game realizes that you've reached a compassion mark once you've given three hundred gold away or something. Yeah, I mean it's got some number that it's just like. As you mentioned, how do you quantify these things? Well, you can do that kind of thing in Twine even, right? You know, you, you assign your variables and your containers and... Can you not tell the difference? Oh, no, bringing them out. Oh, man. Well, come on, you couldn't heal? I remember a long time ago, a very long time ago, like 20 years ago, I was playing, I was playing D D with a friend, and someone else who was in the D D group said he hated Resurrection, Dungeons and Dragons, because why would you ever ask, like, nobody's to get anything done? Like, if you really had a dragon needed to kill, why not resurrect like Hercules? You yeah. know, like you could bring back these heroes of, whoa. So, those people that were chasing you. How does Iolo have zero, he has zero hit points. And they resurrect, but they don't heal. Yeah. Which is really nice. Um, which be, which is why it's handy to have some distance weapons, I guess. But Would you like to, uh, to drive? I can move this. seems to be something that, you know, these combat screens 
seem to come from that tradition. And uh, Thomas was talking before about trains. And, um, it seems like you're like a I mean, crew, but it's like a little setup, obstacles. Very little in the way of, you know, like how you configure your character. Here's a question. I mean, here's a question. This, you know, I. This is. Explained. Oh, um, sorry, dude. Um, you know, this combat is much more sophisticated. I mean, th th using the term sophisticated with these blocks is <laughs> kind of silly to say, but like more than you know, Bart's Tale and Wizardry. I don't know. I don't know if that's. I don't. We'll come back for the chest. I just gotta go over there and get Iolo healed. I think this is gonna happen. Or. Do I have to say open? It's uh, G. Yeah. Iolo, go for it. Could the orc not get around the castle this time? Um, you needed 200, I think, to heal. Oh, really? Yeah. Try Should to check it again, I'm not sure. How do you heal, like, in the field? Is there a spell? There is a spell, yeah. Like I said, we... Last time I played this, I just... Again, I, I tend to do the, the way that I play is I will just spend all my gold, early gold, yearly, on food so I never have to worry about it. And then I spent a lot of time just grinding to get enough to get all the reagents I would ever need to cast every spell. And that took a while. Okay. These guys look serious. And one of my guys has... Oh. oh, nice. Take that troll. What I was going to uh, mention, though, is like, is this more, I guess the question is, I want to say that this is more sophisticated combat system than Bard's Tale Wizardry, where at least as far as a fighter is concerned, your only option is to attack or parry, right? Or, uh, yeah, attack or defend, I think, uh -huh. are your only two things. And, um, and the fact that this game has like a fully realized world that you're wandering around, it has this adventure game placed on top of it. And yet, those games, you know, were just as popular. I don't know where I was going with this. But I was trying to make a comment about, here's tactical fighting. Like, here's kind of a war game tactical fighting. Well, well versus the thing, like, taking up your entire screen and you, you, you can't move. You can run away. If, there, if, there, if it's an option, you can run away, but you can't. You can't maneuver. Right. You know, where here you have, like, Bard's Tale and Wizardry, you have, like, multiple characters. They're all kind of, like, in a line. Mm -hmm. Or there's no, um, you know, so, like, the, what were the, those uh, d d games? Cool Radiance and all those. You could also configure your players in certain ways. Maybe I shouldn't have Iolo open in case it's a gas trap and then it, he goes because he can't take any damage. Yeah, Afshai seems to be uh, a regular acrobat. Oh, there you go. Just spoke too soon. Didn't do any damage though. <laughs> right. 294, so we still don't have enough money to heal him. Well, you can heal him. Oh, it was 200. Now you gotta heal him. Now you gotta heal yourself too. 161 is fine. This is why I'm in like this game does require this game has a significant grind. I mm -hmm. I was uh Grinding is such an important part of these games. Uh, I don't know if you've played. Did we have we talked about Wasteland on this on this channel before? Briefly, and I just I think I just saw it on Good Old Games too, or somewhere, and it's like oh, I gotta gotta pick 
that up now. Well, I, I tried to play Wasteland a, f a few years ago, and then uh, I couldn't believe how much grinding it was. I mean, it, you couldn't take more than five steps without having another one of these combats. Again, that is just a picture of your enemy mm -hmm. and you deciding to take. The, the thing about Wasteland is there's so much resource management because you have ammo and almost everybody has some type of military style gun. That was my point. Was like here, so here we have tactical combat, but I'm like, what? Where is the gameplay in the Wizardry or Bard's Tales? Is it more in resource management? I feel like there's a lot more. Are there more spells in that game, and yet they all seem to? I guess my question was when I was looking at the tactical combat here in Ultimate, is this game actually more tactically? Is it allowing us more options in combat, as opposed to its peers? Feels like I will speak only with Apshai. What? Huh. Or ready weapon hooks. Oh. Oh, you're sleeping. Apshai is asleep. <sighs> Maybe don't put a frickin' sleep force field right in front of your, uh... There we go. Yeah, why would you do that anyway? <laughs> like, that's just a troll behavior. Well, those games t tend to... Damn. Those games tend to foreground the stats, right? The numbers. All that stuff's right. This game only gives you the bare minimum. Uh, health, food, gold. And that's really about it. Those other ones give you all that for each character. Where, where is that? Where's Lord British? Uh, go up. Up the stairs? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this, is the, this is the kitchen though, right? Yeah. goes back to, again, trying to, to peer into uh, Garriott's, what, what he was after. And it, I mean, he's definitely prioritizing, I mean, he's obviously prioritizing the, the uh, metaphysical, but it's still, the problem is it's still anchored in some type of notion of truth. And this kind of uh, something out there that's. How did you get him to level you up? I have no idea. I just talked to him and he leveled me. That was it. Uh, can you say level? I did. <laughs> what was his brother's name? That we haven't gone enough, enough. I just thought I would I'm gonna try talking to him again because that's what I, I, I got out and then I tried talking to him again. And he... yeah. So, that at some point in the conversation, I must have gotten some type of experience just from talking to him. That's the only thing I can think of. Come on, dude, come back here. It's like a mini game. Of, uh, I'm sorry, don't mean to walk into the British. Oops, no, no. So I just want to make sure that everyone, you know, that we're recognizing that it's almost, it almost seems like an indictment of, uh, of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. <laughs> there would be a shining example that there is more to life than the endless struggle for possessions and gold. Or, or, you know, I don't know. I was trying to think about the, what are the, what is the narrative? 
narrative uh, goals of Bard's Tale and Wizardry. What? They're trying. You're trying to save Scarabray and Bard's Tale and Wizardry. You're trying to kill a mad, mad wizard. But wait, this came up in when we were playing um, last week, Wednesday, uh, D and D, where there was this. Or maybe it was two weeks ago, sorry, in the conversation bit about uh, player styles. Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, and Chuck had mentioned a certain type of player who had, who was basically reared on video games rather than tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. And so that this kind of plays out in the style. When they sit down to play an RPG, they play very much like they would play, as he put it, World of Warcraft. And how is that? So the type of person that comes in, gets the armor or equipment or the stats that they need to, to progress, and then is done. Not really interested in the story. Not interested in the collaborative work or anything that's, that, that can potentially take place in right. a tabletop RPG. Um, so maybe this is what the, that's the type of player that Richard is or Garriott is um, kind of speaking to because we, it keeps coming up with this theme that Garriott's after a meaningful gaming experience one that Really, nothing sort of uh, transformative, you know. I'm so sure you'd be after something beyond possessions and gold. Now, I may be a little goofy with the, when it comes to <laughs> virtues, but. So, you're kind of making the point that in some ways this is trying, like. The idea of Richard was trying to capture more of a tabletop experience. Or what he wanted to be a tabletop experience. I think the whole adventure game milieu in this, you know, the idea of being able to talk to them. I mean, I think, I would, you know, I don't want to think about what Richard Garriott is experiencing, but there was recently, I didn't watch it, and I think it might have been one of the Matt Chats thing, but in, recently they interviewed, uh, I think it was Andrew Green, Robert. Andrew Greenberg and Robert Wood had the designers for Witcher, yeah, I can't remember which one was interviewed. But they, the conversation was literally about why... Designers for Witcher? Wi wizardry. Oh, wizardry. Wizardry, sorry. Yeah. Why they had decided that this game was going to be... Just concentrate on um, the combat. And that's what I'm saying is I wish I watched it because I don't know what the reason was that they gave. Well, it's probably easier. It, it, it's certainly easier. And here's the question: We can we make fun of Ultima for? Does this seem? I mean, is this capturing anything like a tabletop experience, or does it come out as awkward and strange? I our expectations are so low in 1984 that this is probably pretty impressive to us. You, I, I find it impressive now, to be honest. Just the attempt. Have you ever played a, like one of those uh, solo D and D modules? Oh yeah. Is this no? This is about as awkward and clumsy <laughs> as that experience, right? You know, it's it's. I had I had one of those modules, but I had a, n a number of like these weird hybrid choose your own adventure Lord of the Rings books where you would flip pages and adjust your stats and all this other yeah. weirdness. Um, We've talked about sorcery on here, haven't we? I don't think so. Um, do you know what I'm talking about with Steve Jackson? Do you know the Finding Fantasy game books, which is what sounds like what you're talking about? No, I don't think so. So, really quickly, I don't mean to waste time on this, but uh, they were some of my favorite books. I love Choose Your Adventure books as a kid, which makes sense that I now study Ludo Narratology. Um, so there was a series of books called Finding Fantasy Game Books. The two main authors were Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston. Hmm. And they were, they were Choose Your Own Adventure books where you had th only three characteristics for your character. Strength, stamina, and luck. And it would, you know, you would reach a section in the book where it would say, hey, well, you might have a section that was like, uh, test your luck, and then you try to roll under or over whatever your luck score was. But then you might find a creature, and there was a very, very basic combat mechanic to do so. So, 
those were the fighting fantasy books. Now, the sorcery books, and this is why this is interesting, were a series of four books that were supposed to be more adult. Uh, oh, interesting. Much more. The, the fighting fantasy books are almost all dungeon crawls, and they're all rather basic. The sorcery ones... So, th they actually came as a f book of five books. Four of them were... Uh, those are the fighting fantasy books, yeah. um, and but and I, I will yeah. So the fifth book was actually a spell book where you had to read the whole book. We had to there was a spell per page. It actually looks similar to the Ultima one where there's a spell per page and says what the spell does. You had to memorize three letters which would allow you to cast that. You were supposed to read the book and memorize the spell like so fireball might be the word would be zap right you had to remember zap <laughs> now you're supposed to read this whole thing and memorize it and then go into the actual sorcery book and it would say would you like to cast a spell and give you like four choices to make one might actually be zap and then four would be nonsense so you had to rely on your ability to have uh, memorized the actual spells and considering who i was when i was 13 years old I totally <laughs> memorized that book I uh, had them as a kid and I actually rebought them about four years ago because mm. I've never gone through the whole book series to do it the reason that it's interesting is that the company Inkle who was formed by John Ingold who is a big name in interactive fiction um, he his company Inkle has uh, adapted all of the all of the sorcery books hmm. to uh, mobile applications. So now there's an app, so you can oh, now wow. play any of those sorcery books on your phone, your your iPad, or whatever. Oh, cool. I reviewed the first one for AdventureGamers.com. When I did that, I realized how much sorry John Ingold, how much I liked it better than I liked playing it. Um, you no longer had to memorize the spell. And there's just something so different about the quality of playing of, with a book and having my notes in front of me, yeah. where the application and literally I could get through that. The first I want you, you could play almost a read through of that book in about 30 minutes, where that book thing I just had to sit down for two hours and think about each of my next steps. And the choices are always binary because I always turn to what page. <laughs> uh, I got amazing reviews, and I mean I, I gave it a very good review, but. The book came with such like they're like if you you know if your character dies you have to start over at the beginning of the book. Um, anyway, so that was again okay. a long, long soliloquy. I love those books. Yes. No, he's is he running? Mm -hmm. Now is it compassionate to taunt him as he's running away like I am? <laughs> some of the conversation that we're having all of these were attempts to recreate whether by yourself and often by yourself the Dungeons and Dragons experience you know all of them are using tropes developed by Gary Gygax and mm -hmm. Arneson who are of course stealing tropes from wargaming well that's the th and that's what is um I think most interesting and overlooked is that these games are trying to encapsulate a, a inherently social experience in an activity that uh, whether it was assumed because I I still think I mean this and this goes back to Thomas's question earlier about taking notes and everything these games were often played socially. Um, right. Early, I mean, the Atari Twenty Six Hundred was meant to be in your living room, not in your bedroom. Like a lot of people have, you know, it's a solitary. It's an activity that physically you could be isolated, but it's often done socially. I mean, this is trying to do something that game players had been probably been after for all, for some time trying to play and it's no fun playing a game by yourself <laughs> but this kind of this well let's this is a I, I found a shrine to what I have no idea 
And again, there's no way for us to mark where I am other than our memory, which is how we did it when yeah. we were 13, to be like, oh, I'm going to go forth. But I want to bring up a point about that because I was thinking, this isn't, again, it's not necessarily an academic point. We talk about how game playing has changed. My wife and I talk about this all the time because we were trying to play all the Legend of Zelda games together because it was fun to play together. And mm -hmm. I'd never played, I had never played the first Legend of Zelda game. I don't, oh, I hadn't, when my, when I finally got an NES, it was, the second Legend of Zelda had come out. The second Legend of Zelda, which I have finished with the help of the Nintendo help guide, um, is nothing like the first one. And the, the secrets, the, the where you're supposed to go in that first Legend of Zelda are so, um, basically impossible to find, you know, at least all of them together, unless you're some kind of insane completionist like myself um but even so, and that's not true i'm not a completionist but i like to i guess it's an adventure game holder but my point is the only way really for you to solve zelda when it came out in 1984 five i guess it would have almost been a contemporary of ultima is to have like six kids playing at the same time and all of you are discovering hmm. legend of zelda 86 86. So it's not that, it's almost a contemporary of this, right? Mm -hmm. But because the find certain of those dungeons really takes, you know, you, you almost have to have like enough friends that you're almost like a playtesting squad, yeah. right, to find out those things. And I think this is the same thing, right? There's no way, I think, playing on your own, I shouldn't say that. I, there were a bunch of people in that one blog who played and said that they were able to get through this all by own. I certainly could it at yeah. 13. I think you and I probably played the same way where we stumbled around a lot, had some fun, and were like, shit, because I, I never even found a dungeon. Yeah. After hours and hours of play, until I went over to my friend James Ford's house, and he's like, "Oh, do you never found where to find the balloon to go over the mountains?" I'm like, "No, man!" And all of a sudden, we're in a hot air balloon. I'm like, "I would never have found this." Yeah. Um, anyway, I did find a shrine. There is no way for me to save where I am, so we know what it is. It's obviously not the shrine of compassion because we do have that rune. Um. Well. Vesper, which is a delicious drink. Oh, sorry, 246, okay. This is definitely one that has a, some things going on. I need a Hulk. But doesn't it, I think it's, I think this really speaks to your point about uh, community gaming, about how it's a social experience. I don't think, I think you're right, you know talk about the Atari 2600 being the living room like I do think games were I don't know if that's true because now we have a million we have multiplayer games I had a student in my class make a point that she felt games because they no longer had like she's talking about console games no longer had uh, split screens you know like you might play oh, Goldeneye yeah. by Nintendo 64 with four people and you have four your four screens now all the multiplayer is done there's multiplayer so there's communities but they're all anonymous communities yeah. and, and you know I play a lot of Hearthstone, which is really my own my own really? vice because it's okay. the only time I have, I can play a game of Hearthstone in between doing a page when I'm writing. That's about all I have time to play. Yeah. But it's funny you can't say anything to the other players beyond hello, <laughs> threaten. Wow. I use threaten a lot because I think it's funny. <laughs> um, yeah, well, hello, good. You know what is it? Amazing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that's because of how you know internet trolls, right? Yeah, and we. I, I've watched my children do this a lot. Well, my, my one son loves Fortnite, loves Overwatch, loves Team Fortress 2, and it's always interesting because he mutes people almost immediately. And I always, I'll catch a sliver of conversation beforehand, and it's it's just, it's so hysterical to listen to, to gaming trolls. They haven't changed one look. They're the same. Um, and he just mutes them. Uh, responsibly, so I'm, I'm kind of thankful for that, but yeah, uh, by comparison, Hearthstone is what was it, another game that was like that I think I think Fortnite has mics sorry, I thought I, I, thought I could recollect a game that uses the same type of thing I think Shazbot is going to tell us that we have to talk to Nate the Snake. Oh, good. Uh, unfortunately, I think Nate the Snake is... You're kidding. Long. Pride. 
That was weird. I'm not sure. I'm, I get the feeling because it's a small town. I'm not sure if this one is associated with the virtue, but I don't know that. Um, oh, there's been a lot of comments there. Yeah, mostly Kristen and myself. Nice. Yeah, I. I love the story about Star Frontiers, and I can't. And I want to say it involves all sorts of. It's like this cast of characters. I think it's out of Dungeons and Dreamers, but it's like uh, Steve Wozniak, Bruce Sterling, just this wild assemblage of sci-fi geekdom and gaming geekdom all in this room and the way it's described is some someone's wife is playing star frontiers or star raiders the atari 2600 yeah and every like 20 30 people at, in this dinner party where people are typically like in the parlor or the kitchen they're all huddled around this game sitting in the dark uh-huh and it was the i can't remember who they were who the interview is with, but this kind of uh, sea change, recognizing that um, entertainment was about to uh, be changed. But, and that's always the strange thing, if you've grown up in arcades or with board games, the so even video I mean video games always had a social component to them. Even when you were playing an arcade game by yourself, you were if the if you were paying attention to this the high scores, you were playing against someone, you know, someone unknown. <laughs> yeah. you were really good you had a couple people watching and that was very rare I think that I don't think I ever witnessed that other than <laughs> the people older than me or, or in the movies you know what of the arcade yeah how oh, I was I mean yeah, yeah. Um, and then and then arcade games became social with two two, uh, two or four player games um, well you, you when you had the two player but simultaneously, I right. guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was thinking about like watching other people playing games. I mean, yeah. I'll never forget when Dragon's Lair came out. Oh. You know? yeah. I mean, there was a crowd of people around, yeah. and like if somebody knew how to make that game work, and you know, continue on the story of it, that dude was the freaking bad, bad assassin in the arcade. Oh, yeah. You know. Um, I mean, I, you know, I was a kid, obviously in the arcades, and I, I do. I remember watching a lot of folks play games and just being like, wow. Yeah. I've um, seen. Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. I can't remember the other spy game. The three are sold as a package now. And I just... I don't even want to go there. Because Dragon's Lair was so frustratingly difficult. I have completed it. Really? Uh, on I bought it on... Uh, I think I bought it from my iPad. And, oh my uh, goodness. It's it's one of those stupid things where like just uh, I, these are total hodo, total nostalgia hodo. It's like I was like I needed to be that guy, and I wanted to see the end of the damn thing. Right now, of course, I could cheat and just write YouTube, right? But for some reason, I, I think the I mean I think the iPad is much easier than the arcade version ever was, uh, just because the controls and mm. you know I I rem there were different settings for the Dragon's Lair's machines, and I, I I believe this is true. I'm not sure, but I think. Maybe they did have this, and I didn't notice it as a kid, but as an adult, it was easy to notice that the, the game makes a little ping when you're supposed to make 
a mm. move in a certain direction. Uh, when I was 13, I did, by the, by the way, buy a book called How to Win at Video Games. <laughs> and it came with like all the different strategies for each of those games. And one of them was Dragon Slayer. I don't have that book anymore. I wish I did. But it's just trial and error once you understand. It's like, all right, I guess we're supposed to go left here. Dragon Slayer. It's funny. I mean, this is a total tangent, but we were the a discussion came up at a collaboratory meeting the other day about inclusion in games, and that's and we've talked a little bit. We talk a lot about the history of games in this. Um, the yeah, I keep thinking, like, where were the female players when I was playing? We just there were just were none. I, there, there were, but not in my group. I, I admit that in junior high, there were... Awesome. Go ahead, yeah. Um, I was as terrified as... I was only... I'm only slightly less terrified of people now than I was then. <laughs> but back then, I mean, gaming came after... Like, the circle of friends had already formed... One person decided, hey, I got this D&D game, let's try it. Okay, and then that was it for years. Um, it's a little bit better in college, but not much. I think it was, I think, my girlfriend at the time. But that was about it. Anyway, so this got me thinking. I've been thinking about this and found a, a medium essay. I can't remember her name, but it's all, it's about some of the early female creators that worked for TSR back in the original, like Gygax. And, and there was this great module that was infamous. I guess it had only been printed. It, it was taken off the press. Palace of the Silver Princess. Yes, I had that. Yeah. I don't think I had the infamous version, however. But I remember it very distinctly. And I was really bummed out to, to, and this goes, the whole point is, that's like your video games book. Mm -hmm. One of these great things that's just gone. If we only knew. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny because, you, and I, I guess why I really, what's really frustrating about it is, is this really, how much that contributes to these histories of games that are just kind of forgotten. The, the, the women, the trans developers that worked in the early gaming industry that by and large, I mean, we're just, we're, it's always piecemeal. Right. Little bits yeah. here, little bits there. Right. And I find it, I'm, I don't know, I'm, this isn't a story, there's not any other, but one of the most famous, I don't know, I don't know if the story is, is, has some relevant story you're talking about. But I mean, well, and I, I typed this to you, I think, on, on our Slack channel. But I said that, you know, Gary Gygax came out once, and he said that, you know, at one point, TSR wanted to make games that appealed to women gamers, and they, they got no traction for them, right? Mm. Um, but he said, you know, because of those experiences, he said, well, women just don't have the same um, yearning for adventure that men do, which I think is, is, is fairly ridiculous. Um, I do, I, I mean, the wargaming communities are all completely male, and I mean, I think... There's more women in role playing now, as we as it has left the wargaming field. Now, why does wargaming still maintain such a? Well, I mean, if you went to a Warhammer tournament this tomorrow, would you see any women? I don't know if you would. I was going to bring up. I thought it was interesting. You know, to the two to so designer, Paul Jacques, who uh, I don't know, did some did some game design work, but did a lot of illustrations for a lot of the old dungeons. If you when you read the old Dragon magazines, you'll see a lot of. Um, you know, illustration by Paul Jack Hayes. Okay. And Paul Jack Hayes is now Janelle Jack Hayes. Um, okay. And one of the main design, main game designers, game programmers, I should say, oh, she did design um, Bard's Tale 3 and then Dragon Wars, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be the sequel to Bard's Tale 3, was uh, um, <sighs> Berger Bill Heineman was okay. her name when she worked for Exxon, also became transition. Uh, transition to a female and now works for a company called Old School. Her and Janelle are now married. Um, mm. And I, I don't, I don't, like I said, I'm not trying to bring up, like, let's throw some examples of, 
uh, you know, marginalized communities in the game world. But I do yeah. find that interesting, especially because Paul J. Case was such. We're talking the original D and D was in a, was a pioneer on that uh, of, of like it's both the design and the illustration side. I think a lot of times at TSR, if you got in at anywhere the ground floor, you would probably end up designing a module at some point. Um, but yeah, and like I said, Burger Bill Heineman, which you can find in the old Bard's Tales. Um, and now they have this company together that works on old, it's called Old School. Anyway, it's just kind of it's interesting. A, it's a development company? It is. Okay. They've done, they were supposed to do the, they were supposed to do the new, the, the remaster of the original Bard's Tale. And they seem to have had a falling out mm. with, uh, you know, in Exile and that does it, which is interesting because it's Brian Fargo. So, Burger, the, the name Burger was because, uh, evidently liked to eat cheeseburgers and used to keep them in the desk uh, when <laughs> she was coding late nights. It's a couple of strange stories. Um, I don't know, but two, two, like I said, kind of two legendary names um, that did the original work as men in the transition mm. to women and, and still kind of keep up with the, with the hobby and still involved in it, which I think is kind of interesting. But as a regular, I think TSR, of course, is interesting and I'm going off. Yeah. The CEO of TSR was a woman um, you know, after the one, so what the heck is her name? Brenda? Brenda Williams? That's not right. I'm getting confused. Roberta Williams wrote King's Quest. Brenda, King's Quest. Brenda but, um, Romero. <laughs> yeah. Who I, um, anyway, the company, TSR, was floundering. Um, Gary Gygax, the Bloom Brothers, who he had kind of handpicked to run TSR, were running the company into the ground. So he had... I can't remember where he met this woman, but she had a business chops, and he thought it was exactly who TSR needed to run it. And then one of the first, I shouldn't say the first thing she did, one of the things she did in the first couple of years that she was there, of course, was kick Gary Gygax out of the company. Lorraine Williams. Lorraine Williams, thank you. Um, but she was the head honcho of TSR, so you talk about, you know, women at stages. Of... But it's funny, I mean, so, I'm not, I, I swear I wasn't going to go further into this, but the... The medium post, and I, and I'll probably, I'll, I'll put this on the blog or whatever. But the, um, the post refers to an old dragon article, and I can't thank you enough for sharing the link to the the dragon magazine because I swear that's what's so nice about this is now you can go back to those old dragon magazines. So this, the creator, the woman who created. Silver Princess. What is yeah, it? Palace of the Silver Princess, and I can't remember her name either. And she's, she, she and another author both share these experiences about being female players. Mm -hmm. And like any good D&D &D player, they talk about even just the stats. It, anyone who looks at the, like the strengths statistic, it's right. obviously been a, a, a huge subject of scrutiny. And they're like, well, that's fine. Men are the strongest man will always be stronger than right. the strongest woman. Gotcha, right. but you know how about we compensate for with dexterity and they, mm -hmm. you know, they go right. into this. But there's also this discussion about you know when you when you're taught when you're thinking about the the prototypical game player, and there's a point where either in this blog or in this article, this person is obviously talking about guy gax. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. This head, the uh, beer gutted, bearded man. <laughs> well, that that could also describe ninety five percent of uh, of but, gaming, probably in nineteen seventy eight too. And I think the context was like, oh, yeah. ooh, wow, that's. <laughs> it, but it, it's so. It, what makes this so breathtaking is how um, assertive it is. Mm -hmm. There's, there. It's coming. It seems. This to is be, in Dragon Magazine. Mm -hmm. this, yeah, and I'll. I'll I'll put it up there. It's it's a really interesting read, and I, it definitely makes me want to like delve into, yeah, Dragon yeah, yeah, Magazine yeah. because I think well, yeah, this yeah. person was like the 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 sage had the sage role. Um, huh. Uh, anyway, there's this medium post talks about three different people. There was the illustrator for the Greyhawk map. Yeah, the Darlene, the artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there's uh, there's another one in there as well, but just. It, what's frustrating for me is that it, again it's so piecemeal mm -hmm. it, this is a very nice post right but you know we don't have the volumes of history that we have I mean Gygax I mean but I, did, I had no idea about Lorraine Williams yeah 
and it's kind of frustrating, you know, because especially if this is the person responsible for being, bringing the, the company back from the brink. Yeah, well, she, I mean, she didn't. Um, no, she yeah. was yeah. She would let <laughs> she would let Guy Gax go, and then it, that didn't help at all. And then later she was they there. made a bunch of business. Eleven years, really. Ninety-seven. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was something else I wanted to add to what you. So I was gonna I was gonna point out. I think it's the second episode of Dragon. There is a. It's 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 kind of funny because I think we're well over time now, but. Um, I want to say the second or third episode of Dragon, and it's a whole thing. It's like playing a female character in D and D, and it is problematic. It's so funny because oh, like some of the things are like, well, if you're playing a female thief, you now have this instead of like climb walls. It's like, it, I'm not doing it justice. It isn't exactly this, and I should look it up before I say it. But it does. But one of maybe it's maybe it's a mage, but it's like the ability is to seduce main characters. You know, and it, it's just, it's yeah. more like it's more like these characters are are male fantasies of and I mean to be fair it's fair to the fiction that inspired D&D right yeah. I mean if we're talking about power fantasies for guys I mean again the fiction the, the, the appendix and fictions were all I mean I don't I don't want to because I love some of those fictions right but they yeah. were all written by men and they were all you know they tended to I mean, power fantasies is a very reductionist way to talk about them but they did live in, you know the, and, and that's where D&D kind of formed from you know the classic you know, the Robert E. Howard type stories again. I don't want to pick up Robert E. Howard because that's such brilliant too, but it is not the most progressive worldview. Yeah, I mean, so that I mean, that, that's kind of left me. I, maybe I could just leave this here because the uh, I don't have an answer to this question. It's like, how do we rectify this? I mean, it, it's 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 kind of nice. we have the resources at hand where we can you know bring up these histories and do. But how do we look back on history at that time, or gaming culture, and say, um, how do we make amends? I don't know if you can. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's. I mean, I think you just don't make the same mistakes going forward. You know. I mean, sure. I, think, I mean, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's always something to be said for you know, kind of discover some of those lost voices. Um, but yeah, I mean, rectifying them. Yeah, I think it's. I think the only thing you can do is just do what you can to be better right. going forward. <laughs> I mean, it sounds simple, but I don't. It, it's difficult for not having. I mean, you hear these stories from female players and, and being like if they're playing a female character, being told to you know in game to seduce. Mm -hmm. I think there's one story right. where I, you don't know how. But it's like being told to, to seduce a bunch of dwarves and do all this other weird shit that you would never ask a male player right, to do. Right, right. That type of thing. And Despite the fact I was always looking to seduce dwarves. <laughs> it's like, I can never, I can, I, I never, I don't recall ever having a situation yeah. like that. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, fun. Next time. Good ne times. Next time we'll have an answer to Here that. on Digression Quest. Yeah, so. Um, Great knowledge for everyone there. We are done. I guess we're just hanging out here. Yeah, I quit. I quit and saved a while ago. So oh, okay. all this passing didn't didn't actually happen when we hit turning oh, on okay. next time. Um, so again, I, I think. Well, we should. We can talk on the off thing. I think we're going to need to come up with some type of strategy as to what we're going to do. But I, I, somehow we have to map this land, right? And we've got to figure out where each of these places are. I've gotten us lost somewhere. Vesper. We know that the shrine to something is a little bit to the northeast of it, but I don't know. I don't even know what the thing of Vesper is, so. Maybe to a moon gate. I feel like we've made some, some good progress, though. We have the compassion rune and mantra, but we haven't found... Well, we haven't been compassionate enough to get it anyway. Yeah. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, isn't compassion, like, one of the hardest ones to get in this game? I don't know. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I'm done. All right, see you all in two weeks. We're off. Are we off? Uh, I hate this. Multiple keyboard stuff. Oh. Excuse me.